uh, briefly introduce uh, the uh, next speaker. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming, Alex. So the next speaker is Professor Alex Weibel. I think it's fair to say that he's the world champion in speech recognition and machine translation. And we are extremely happy to have you here in our uh, Shanghai lecture series. I think this is a wonderful experience for our students that they can hear, the, let's say, the, the, the champion himself. He's also, Alex Weibel is also a very successful businessman who has founded several companies, several well-functioning companies, and he also flies his own helicopter, so he's a helicopter pilot. He is a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh and at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. He directs the INTERACT, the International Center for Advanced Communication Technologies, which is a joint operation between the two universities with an emphasis on speech recognition, language processing, speech translation, multimodal and perceptual user interfaces. Uh, at the Carnegie Mellon, he also serves as the Associate Director of the Language Technologies Institute and holds joint appointments in the Human Computer Interaction Institute and the Computer Science Department. So we are very much looking forward to your talk now, Bridging the Language Divide. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. All right. Well, thanks so much for the invitation and kind introduction. Uh, let me just jump right in. I find this discussion extremely interesting because you're thinking about what does intelligence mean and what is intelligence. And uh, we are a group of scientists or people in the speech and language field are kind of schizophrenic. Part of us really is interested in this question what intelligent behavior is and how um, does intelligence work? And indeed, language is one of the most powerful expressions of human intelligence. So it would behoove us to really think about how the brain does it and how we do it, and there's a lot of philosophizing on it. On the other side, there is a, is a, a famous saying in uh, the speech community where people say, airplanes don't flap their wings. So you don't necessarily have to imitate exactly what, uh, what nature does in order to get a particular function or behavior of a, of a system that does a useful uh, function for us. So let me touch on both of these things a little bit in the course of the lecture, but also give you a little bit of a view of what is actually doable today. So um, the practical problem that we're motivated in, particularly when we're, we're talking about speech and language and translation, is the combination of a problem called speech recognition and a problem called machine translation. The one is to convert a, an acoustic signal into a text, typically, and the other one is to convert te text from one language into another language on the other side. And if we, in fact, want to look at speech-to-speech -speech translation systems, we may actually have also then synthesis, speech synthesis on, at the end of that chain, so that you can hear the spoken word in the other language. Now, uh, why are we interested in this? It is a huge practical problem, enormously practical and enormously important. We all now live in a global village. We have uh, increasing interaction around the world, and that interaction involves multiple cultures and multiple languages. At the same time, everybody is proud and happy about their own cultural diversity, that we speak our own language. We can't really imagine switching all German lectures, for example, to English, even though some universities contemplate this, there is complaint and pushback. People want to speak their own language. In fact, the European Parliament, uh, we just came back yesterday, we visited the European Parliament, and we're amazed what they're doing there. They have 24 translator booths to translate essentially from any language in the European community to any other language by human effort. It's a gargantuan effort that they're doing, a huge logistical problem, and uh, still they're doing it because in a, a community of countries, people really want to speak in their own language, and still they have to understand each other. So now the European Parliament can, of course, afford doing this. Uh, they're spending one point, my numbers are 1.3 billion euro a year, generally in the European Community Commission, to do translation and interpretation, and in the European Parliament alone, 
is spending 300, more than 300 million euros a year on translation services. That's just the European Parliament. Now, for the rest of us in universities, etc., forget it. We can't afford this. We can't do this in 24 languages. It's un unthinkable to have translator booths even into one language, let alone 24 or even more. There are 6,000 languages in the world, so the problem is absolutely intractable. Can't really do this by human effort. There's not enough humans on the planet to do this, let alone people who speak these languages. So there's a huge opportunity for automation, and I will skip over some of these slides. There's a lot of this on how large the market is and how many language pairs there are, YouTube and the media, television and lectures, meetings, etc. All of this uh, makes that problem worse. And if you, if you thought that English is the solution to all our world's language problems, then even if you look at Europe, where people speak actually generally good uh, English, it's only on average between uh, around 40% of Europeans speak English good enough, well enough, that they would be able to uh, communicate. You see here the statistics in, among the Europeans. It's not good enough that everyone can co participate into with, uh, con uh, co communicate with everybody else in English alone. Now, it's also a social problem because it's generally the educated who will speak English as a common language, but we can't rely on this, you know, if we want to really reach everybody. So that's why the human, uh, why the European Parliament does it by human effort. Now, if we want to build a machine that does this, we're really talking, as I said, uh, said a chain of three different aspects of problems. One is the speech recognition to convert an acoustic signal into text, then translating that text from one language into another, and on the other side to synthesize, synthesize it back out so that you can hear it. If you want to have a dialogue between two people, the whole thing goes in reverse, but the other person can answer in their language, and it come, goes back to your own uh, language uh, uh, um, in, in uh, reverse. Now, what does it take to build these systems? And first of all, if you look at this, each one of these problems is very, very hard. People have worked for decades on this, on the, each of these problems. Why? Because language is ambiguous. It's never really completely clear. And, and hence, it is one of those problems that we consider intelligence behavior, to make sense out of our environment. If an acoustic signal hits us, and as the previous speaker has just mentioned, if we say something like, uh, mat, fat, cat, hat, uh, and so forth. Every word in the English language, on average, has at least one other word that, uh, that differs only by one phoneme. So we have a lot of similar sounding words, and we have noise in the, in the environment, and uh, it's not clear necessarily what you have said. It's a very noisy and poorly represented process. Now, well, why did we even come up with speech? So I had a very good discussion with Rolf and Rolf Pfeiffer over this because um, it, is, it turns out that actually our vocal tract, the physics of our vocal tract, really determine what sorts of symbols we would typically pick for representing speech. It's a communication tool. We could imagine that we have some Morse code in which we exchange ideas, but we, ha we just so happen to develop a, a uh, symbol set that the vocal tract is well fit to produce and that our ears can actually um, put into certain classes. But it's a very ambiguous process. We don't know really when we hear a signal, particularly surrounded by nose, noise, which one of these words was spoken. So this first, um, this first module here, the ASR, automatic speech recognition, has that problem. What is the most likely sequence of words that could have been said here when I receive a speech signal? Now, that second problem is the machine translation. It's similarly ambiguous. We don't know necessarily which word was said. You know, if I say something like um, nail, am I talking about the nail that you hammer in the wall or am I talking about my fingernails? It turns out in Spanish you say these things differently. You say a clavo for the nail you hammer in the wall and la uña for the fingernail that, that you have on your finger. So it really depends on the context and what you're trying to express, which word you would uh, translate it into. Now, that's 
many people would argue is clearly semantics really means understanding the world. But as you will see, we're actually also surprised how much we can get simply by uh, context, by some features and some knowledge about the context in which that word arose in order to do a reasonably good job. Now, the easiest, in some sense, in this chain is the TTS. The text-to-speech synthesis only took 10 to 15 years of research. I was a uh, student at MIT when this first TTS system in the world came out, uh, the, my talk, MIT text-to-speech system. And, in, and since, there have been, of course, a lot more elaborate systems that have been developed. But it's a pro the reason why it's easier is you don't necessarily have the ambiguity. Once you have the words, you can convert it into a signal, and if you always generate the same signal, it doesn't create a problem. It's an understandable speech signal. So these are the three modules that we're typically dealing with. Now, um, in each one of these, the question, the trade-off that we always have is how deep do we have to go into this understanding? People have argued that speech recognition and machine translation really requires a deep understanding of the world and uh, of language in order to be able to do it. It turns out that the trend in general is actually the opposite. Given the internet and the massive amounts of data that we can collect today, uh, a lot of the modern algorithms really resort to gigantic or massive amount of training on this data in order to get the right contextual uh, knowledge, the right uh, probabilistic representation, and probabilistic modeling so that you can find what the, what the most likely translation of a word is and what the most likely recognition of a speech signal is. So the model typically looks something like this. This is an oversimplified model of what these modern translation systems look like today. But effectively, um, you have a statistical uh, uh, expression where you say, well, I have a source language text and I have a target language text. And what I say is, uh, and in fact, it goes back to the roots of computer science when people after World War II were trying to decode uh, ciphered messages, uh, decode secret messages from the enemy. A lot of the funding came from that. And so machine translated this rooted in that tradition originally where people say, I have a foreign message. And really to understand what that message means is a decoding problem, is a problem of finding out what that secret code is that converts one into the other. So there's nothing super deep in this. Now, has this been the only way of doing it? No. We have also experimented a great deal with so-called interlingua, which are semantic representations, where we convert that text into a deep semantic representation, and from that semantic representation go into the target text. And there's still a trade-off and a debate which is the better way. The clear advantage of this approach is you can train it on massive amounts of data. And that's what we do today. We do some pre-processing, but then by and large, it's simply a statistical measurement that has two models. One is a translation model and one is a language model. What the translation model does is it simply says there are vocabularies. So there is nail, and nail could be translated as unia. It could be translated as clavo. And there's a certain probability how likely it is that you translate one word into the other. Think of it like a dictionary. When you open up a, mo a normal dictionary for your own language needs, you typically have three or four translations. And typically, the most likely one that most people will mean with that word is the one that comes up on top in your dictionary. So it's a similar idea. We have in the system a, a probabilistic dictionary that, that does that. Then there's a language model, though, and that's, again, akin to what you see in the, in the um, dictionaries, where you say, where you say um, how is this word used in context? Hammering a nail may be much more likely to be translated as clavo, because hammer and nail really fits together. And we can represent that simply by the statistical context or by the statistics of how often we've seen that word in that context. Now, this is, sounds extremely simple. And people have criticized this. You know, How can you just simply by counting neighborhoods um, do translation or speech recognition? It turns out that many of the alternative models have uh, not managed to beat that very simple statistical model. And so it is very powerful indeed, even though continuing research, of course, fo focuses and looks at deeper and more complicated models. So now let me walk you through, through quickly through, through some of the systems that are 
um, currently being built and that have been developed in the in the past uh, decade or two. Um, we started in the late 80s, early 90s. We were here in Europe and in the US, the first speech-to-speech -speech translation system that was ever shown to the public. It's, it's called Janus. We developed it uh, here between Karlsruhe and Carnegie Mellon. It was a system that was extremely um, slow. It took us minutes on a workstation for a sentence to come through. It could only ha handle 200 sentences. And you had to say and read and speak these sentences in well syntactic form. So if you stuttered or um, repeated yourself, forget it, then it was off and wouldn't work. So it wasn't practical. You couldn't go travel with, with a workstation and then say 200 sentences. So the next thing we focused on in the, in the 90s was to, to say you can learn to be limited to a particular topic of discussion. Let's say you're taking a taxi or you're in a restaurant. The domain may be limited. The sorts of things you want to say is limited. But you have to allow people to express it any way they want. Otherwise, it's not practical. And we found that that is actually extremely rich. People can say, I'm busy in all kinds of different ways. You can say, I'm busy. No, I don't have time. Sorry, I can't do that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm on vacation. I'm, I'm golfing. Uh, I can't, cannot meet with you. Can we do it some other time? There are lots of different ways in which you can express the same semantics, which simply says, no, I'm not available. So that richness became clear to us in the 90s, where both on the recognition side, we needed to, to broaden the scope, and on the, uh, sorry, on the translation side. And on the recognition side, we had to deal with spontaneous speech. People don't speak syntactically correct sentences. They will stutter a lot. Stutter a lot. They repeat themselves. They have so-called so -called, uh, uh, false starts. They have hesitations, uhs and ums, and so forth and so forth. So dealing with corrupted speech as it is being pro, uh, produced spontaneously is one of those issues that people focused on in the 90s. Out of those systems came systems that now go into fieldable, maintainable, spontaneous systems, systems that can actually be used in practice in, in field situations. And the other direction then moved on to say, let us also look at domain unlimited speech, where we no longer restrict our systems to a particular domain of discussion, but we allow any kind of discussion. Can we provide the European Parliament with a system that can support human translators uh, to do their job? Can we use this translation system in academic lectures so that students who don't understand the language of the lecturer can hear the lecture in their own language? Now, for both of these, I will walk you through some of the things that are available today and have hap happened so far. So if we look first at domain-limited consecutive translation, what does consecutive translation mean? Consecutive translation means that I say a sentence, the system translates and br brings it out, the other person hears it and can respond, and I then hear the translation. So it's consecutive. I always say a sentence, you say a sentence, etc. So it's a dialogue. It's a sort of system that we would use when two people will uh, try to do a dialogue, as opposed to simultaneous translation, where somebody gives a monologue, like a lecture, and the translation has to be synchronous or uh, slightly delayed, but in parallel to the speech. So let's look at these consecutive translation systems. Uh, systems. Their use is, of course, particularly attractive for travelers and people in uh, field missions and so forth. So And so mobility is another issue. Can you make it small enough and portable enough so I can put it in my pocket? And that's exactly what we did over the years is we, we finessed this technology and developed it further so that you can do um, consecutive translation uh, in a mobile environment. So after years of research, we knew enough how to do this so that we actually formed a company called Jibigo or Mobile Technologies um, uh, that came out with this product, Jibigo. It is on the Android and on the uh, Apple um, market, on the uh, uh, App Store. So if you look at uh, on the App Store for Jibigo Translator, you find a translation system uh, in many languages uh, that does this. And it's still, uh, we came out with this system in 2009 for Spanish. Now there are 15 languages or 10 to 15 languages that are available. And it's still the only system that you can buy on the App Store that is offline. In other words, it does not rely on uh, having a network 
um, infrastructure behind it. You can download it and then it runs on your phone, and that's, of course, important when you're in a remote area where you can't uh, get a hotspot or something. Um, so let me show a video. Apple liked this very much, so for a while they ran commercials. I took this amazing trip to Spain after college, and with my iPhone, I checked out hostels before booking them, shared pictures as I went. My mom loved that. And I even downloaded this app, which became my personal translator. Where's the train station? ¿Dónde está la estación de tren? All I really needed was my iPhone and my passport. So you see it's a practical product that is out. We, I brought you one here on my iPad also. I don't know if you can see this here in the video. It's uh, the same thing except on, a, on an iPad. And here the idea is, of course, more, let's say you're um, sitting across the table of somebody that you want to carry a dialogue. So you can turn around the uh, text and make it a little bit larger and then say, hello, we are here in Germany. We are giving a lecture. We are, tr we are trying to communicate. Encantado de conocerles. Cuánto tiempo que no nos hemos visto. Vamos a hablar español. But I do not know Spanish. This machine will help us communicate. So you see what it does is you can really go back and forth between English and Spanish. And again, we do that in 15 languages. We have it in Thai and Chinese and Korean and uh, Japanese and uh, many other languages that people now download simply on their app and go travel with it. Um, so more commercials, more applications, and so on. A particular application that I'm interest, uh, interested and excited about is, of course, the impact it has on humanitarian deployment and humanitarian missions. We do uh, participate in several ex uh, um, exercises every year. These are pictures of an exercise we do every year in a humanitarian mission in uh, Thailand. There's another one in Cambodia and Honduras that we actually go there. We deploy these systems. You see our iPads there on the upper left part. And these people get free health care in these missions and these uh, exercises. And uh, as the usually English-speaking doctors try to commute, communicate with the local uh, population, of course, you can use human interpreters, but in uh, emergencies or in humanitarian situations, very often you don't have these interpreters. And so bringing in these systems is a good way of bridging the language barrier and the language gap in order to help people. So the exercises help the people already to communicate. And for us, it's a great way of collecting data and improving the systems and making sure they work better in field situations. Because here again is where the entrepreneur uh, meets the, um, the uh, researcher because in our research lab, everything can be wonderful. And then you go out in the field and you find all kinds of crazy things that are going on in the real world that make your wonderful technology no longer work. So we really have to look at both sides in order to have uh, reasonable contributions to it. And sometimes we're kidding ourselves, of course, with the stuff we do in the lab that doesn't work in practice. So again, you know, we have to look at, at this in a realistic way. This is a wonderful picture I love of a Japanese uh, medical doctor who uses a Japanese English dictionary to look up a Japanese word in English so that the Thai translator can read the English word and then uh, translate it into Thai to the Thai speaker. A week later, we were in the mountains where they're speaking, uh, where the Hmong tribe lives. And the Hmong uh, villagers there couldn't speak Thai, so they had to have yet another translator in between who would then take that Thai word and translate it into Hmong so that person could understand. This screams for automation and for practical solutions. Now let's move to the next um, task. I told you consecutive translation is when we have two people trying to com uh, communicate by way of a dialogue. 
and one says a sentence and the other one responds. The other thing that we're doing is simultaneous translation. So a lecture like I'm giving today, if we had Spanish speakers today in the audience or in the lecture, could they follow my lecture even though they can't speak English? Perhaps we can, in fact, show this now. The problem is fairly large because we do not necessarily have domain-limited speech all the time. But in the case of television and radio broadcast news, lectures and speeches, parliamentary speeches, telephone conversations, meetings, and so on, in all of these situations, we are no longer limited to a particular domain. We're going to be talking open domain, and it's going to be long monologues where people are talking continuously about whatever they're lecturing. Now, in that, that situation, we do not have the consecutive situation, but we do have a long stream of audio of somebody speaking, and the vocabulary is open because it can be about any topic, and if you are in the lecture and you don't understand what the lecturer is talking about, it's very disorienting because you have very little to go by in order to be able to understand the lecture. Now, for our German students here in Karlsruhe, that's a huge problem because we have a lot of students who come from other countries and they would like to hear a German lecture. In fact, for many of them, it's a reason not to come to Karlsruhe because they would have to learn German first. And so we have, in fact, many students who say, that this is a problem for them and that translation is uh, necessary, that they need to other, uh, spend a lot of time learning a particular language in order, uh, learning German in order to follow the lectures. Now, the other problem is that we have, um, of course, parliamentary lectures. In the parliament, we have many lectures being given. They're being given on lots of different topics. Uh, they're going to be continuous monologues. And uh, again, translation in that case is done in a, um, a, by human translators. And they obviously do a better job than the machines, but it is an, 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 at an enormous cost. So what we're trying to do here is to develop systems that can automate that for the applications where the human uh, effort cannot be afforded. Of course, in the parliament, if you have this wonderful machinery of many human translators, uh, it's, of course, preferable and better quality. But um, for the rest of us in, in uh, academic lectures, we need something more automatic. So the system looks similar, like the systems I already showed, except that in this case, we also have to deal with some other problem in between. Namely, we don't know where the sentences begin and where they end. I'm just simply continuing to talk, and I never, you notice that why I'm talking in my lecture, I never say period and comma, uh, I just simply talk. And so the system has to figure out itself where the sentences begin and where they end and how to uh, establish a particular context so that you can do the proper translation. It's also unidirectional because you generally don't have a dialogue, although that may be modified as, uh, as we go if you have a Q&A and a lecture and so on so that we can have a full end-to-end -end simultaneous translation system. Now, how do we deliver this to humans in a particular lecture? There are three different ways. You see here a, t a picture of a typical lecture hall. And one way of doing it is to, uh, to create, or let's say in this case, a meeting of the future. Our vision is to create a meeting room where each one of us can sit in our own chairs uh, and speak in our own language and then listen to the speech of the other people also in our own language. So we had a Chinese listener and speaker in one side and in English, Arabic, and Spanish, all of them should be able to communicate. Now, how can we do that? We can deliver it, first of all, by having heads-up display glasses. Imagine you're wearing glasses that generate subtitles under the faces of people that you're looking at. So you have your translation goggles, or you have um, audio that is beamed. We're experimenting with audio speakers that generate an audio beam just to a particular speaker in the room. So you hear whispered translation in your ears that only you can hear and your neighbor cannot. And the, by far the simplest way to do this is, of course, over the Internet. We all come to lectures with our own personal devices, and students today all have their smartphones in their pockets. So what we're doing here at the University of Karlsruhe, we launched this this summer, is uh, the lecture is given in German, and we give the students a URL so they can simply dial in that particular web page 
and then on their device, they pull out their own personal device or laptop, they go to that URL and they get the subtitles printed out on that, um, on that device. You're seeing here on the screen exactly what that device would show. We just display it here by projection. If you want to follow along to my lecture right now and see the transcript and translation, you can go to the uh, URL yourself and uh, type in the password. It's uh, lt.anthropomatic.kit.edu, and the password is shanghebj. So uh, feel free to look at it and uh, follow along in my lecture. Now, how, do, how does this work? It's the same system, except there is some plumbing in the back, because what we need to do is we need to put, put the speech recognition, the machine translation on servers, and these servers run in the background, adapt and learn from the context, and then there is a um, internet-provided connection with all the devices so that people can subscribe to this particular lecture and then look at the transcript and the translation. As I said, we la launched that this past summer for German lectures, and the lecture that I'm giving to you right now is being transcribed in English and translated into Spanish simultaneously. Now, we're working on other things that are all equally interesting because as the speech is being produced, of course, the lecturers typically also use PowerPoint slides, and these PowerPoint slides need to be translated also. So we have a mechanism for, for dealing with that by taking the PowerPoint slides, translating them, and then putting in like little bubbles that you can put with, go with your mouse at, at that particular position and see what that word on that slide means in your language. Similarly, after the lecture, when the lecture is over, Maybe students want to review what has been said, so there's an archive with past lectures that people can review and can search for aspects of that lecture. Now, um, since I'm running out of time, let me just simply touch on a few things that are hard, particularly for lectures, namely that it's a continuous monologue. We have to find where the punctuation is, where the periods and commas are, and without it, of course, it's hard to really talk about translating sentences. We have things in lectures like coughs and noises. People, <coughs> they uh, cough in the middle of their speech. And you don't want to misrecognize that as a word. You have to filter it out. Sometimes even singing. There are all kinds of strange things that people do in lectures. Um, the vocabularies are much larger than on a portable device. On a portable device, we have 40,000, and it covers pretty much what you may want to say. But in uh, a lecture, usually the vocabulary is larger and you have very special vocabularies, terminology that fit only for this particular topic of discussion. Everything has to run quickly. So you see, in order to do this here in real time, it has to be fast. It has to run uh, in real time, meaning keep up with the speaker. And we need a service infrastructure in order to deliver it. Now, a few things for German. I can't resist to simply tell you a few terrible problems we have in addition to German. Uh, in German, or you know, every language is unique and has its particular challenges. In German, it happens to be word order. For example, in German, the, the word is the verb always comes at the end. And that gives us great headaches uh, in machine translation but it's also a big headache for human translators because you have to wait until the end of the sentence until the verb comes. And the verb may not come for minutes. You may wait a long time and then be wrong. So human translators guess how the story will end and produce a sentence already in the other language. And if their guess was wrong, they have to recover. There are many funny stories we learned yesterday in the European Parliament from the human translators, how they deal with this and what they do and what disasters they've had and so on. And so talk to me afterwards, I'll tell you some of the stories. So for us, of course, we had our stories there too. It's a challenge because you need to uh, do what we call word reordering, naming, finding the word, verb at the end and bring it forward when you translate to English. German has another nasty aspect, which is these, the compounding. We generate very long words. so the Word, word recognition error rate, it's four words in English, it's one word in German by putting everything together into a compound. And uh, so-called uh, inflections and agreement that the endings of all the words have to agree with each other. Um, 
Another interesting thing, of course, is that technical terms is a particular problem. And here is where we use machine learning. Can the, the, uh, the lecture system itself know that I'm currently talking about uh, signal processing and then pull out out of the internet all the relevant words that are related to signal processing and find out how they are used in recognition and translation. In fact, we're doing that. Our system does that, and we're getting better and better at it. Sometimes what we say is not what we write. Uh, think of formulas. If I say f of x uh, or uh, functions of mathematical formulas, you want to type them as a formula, not as a sequence of words. A particular interesting one I'd like to mention, which bothers a great, a great deal, is that language is dynamic. It always changes, and we always add new words. And in particular, notorious is English words. So a German lecture is, is typically peppered with English words, and that's happening everywhere around the world. You have all these words that somehow make it into a German lecture or into a, language in, a lecture in any language um, that come out of another. So typical cases are the word iPhone or uh, a laser gun or uh, cloud computing. You don't speak them in German the way you would when you just read this. They have a particular pronunciation and a particular meaning that comes from English. So you don't, don't say iPhone, but you say iPhone uh, in, in a German lecture too. Uh, and it gets worse when you have German, you have things like web gecasted, downgeloaded, which is even an English word inflected in a German way and pronounced in a German way, but not quite in an English way with a German accent. So it gets very complicated. Now, last problem I want to say is what I call the long tail of language, which means how do we go from one language pair, if it took us decades to research, this problem in one language pair, how are we going to meet our vision, which, we, which I started out with, to reach every language in the world, and that's 6,000 languages. And my hope and dream is that I can still re see that day in my lifetime when we can really do that. And that means we have to drive costs dramatically down. So we're engaged in a number of research programs to do that because, again, as you go down this long tail of language, you come to languages that are much much less well resourced. In other words, there's much fewer dictionaries and databases and internet resources. And there's much less money to do the research on it as well in order to do it. So we're pushing on that cost button. So cost is not just a practical issue. It becomes a real research issue. How we can build these systems more cheap, cheaply and more parsimoniously. How can a learner, a machine learning system, do that with less data? So in conclusion, what we're interested in doing here is to apply all of these things we learn about intelligent systems and intelligent behavior to a real practical problem that we need in communication. In fact, this Shanghai lecture is a very instantiation of this vision that we want to have a community of people working together and understanding each other, even though we come from different cultural backgrounds. So we use AI and machine learning and uh, because without the machine learning from data, it would be a hopeful, hopeless, I'm sorry, it would be a hopeless task. We cannot possibly hope to, to program all these systems. They really must learn. Uh, and we involve increasingly also the user interaction, the user interface itself. We're quite intrigued with, with how learning and adaptation plays a key role to achieving this. But again, uh, the, you know, our collaborators in uh, robotics and other fields, we're co constantly looking at this problem of learning, and we're realizing that it's actually not only learning, but also forgetting. You have to also eliminate information once in a while and um, uh, build systems in this way that are well suited for the particular task you need to do. Um, well, and of course, language portability and robust performance and integration into services, these are all practical research things that we do in order to achieve these systems uh, in, a, in a realistic environment. So with that, let me finish. And uh, I know I over, went over a little bit, um, but I hope I can still entertain some questions. Right. Thank you very, very much, Alex, for a wonderful lecture and for a, fascinating, a really fascinating topic. And as you were mentioning, in the Shanghai Lectures uh, uh, series, it will be fantastic to have the uh, simultaneous language translation and 
I can mention to the, to the students in the audience that were discussing with Alex how we can actually use uh, the uh, language, simultaneous language translation systems and apply it to the Shanghai Lectures context. For example, I mean, Chinese students, they're typically very good or quite good at English, let's say, but it might still be an advantage to have, in addition to the English, also the Chinese translation, right? Yeah. Especially, you know, when talking about subtleties and, you know, things like that. And again, if you okay. dig into the details of uh, how complex this problem is, uh, again, don't think we can deliver tomorrow simultaneous translation in all the languages quite yet. So it will be a, a growing uh, effort. But I think there's so many practical uh, solutions that can be provided already along the way. Even just automatic transcription of, of what the lecturer said is, is a useful thing for uh, foreign listeners. Reviewing a lecture after the fact when it's in the archive with its transcripts is a helpful element and then gradually having translation. So we support Spanish right now, we have German, English, and we're adding languages now as we go. Uh, and again, uh, so Chinese is obviously one of the languages we're interested in doing, so this would be a great opportunity. One thing I'd like to add, Rolf, which is interesting, is, you know, as I said before, language is dynamic and it always changes, so we can never expect everything to remain the same. Every week we're looking at new words that didn't exact, uh, exist last week. So we, you know, there's a word Grexit, for example, Greece leaving the European Union. Uh, oh, <laughs> Brexit, right? And uh, last week they discussed the possibility of Finland because Phil, Finland doesn't want to pay the bills. So they say, will there be a fix it in the future? And so here suddenly we have this new word fix it in the vocabulary. So how do we deal with this when this constantly happened? So we have adaptive mechanisms to do this. But the other thing we're exploring that's quite interesting is more and more crowdsourcing techniques so that people in the lecture themselves can take a look and say, oh, this is wrong and uh, improve it so that the systems learn simply from the inst instruction of the users themselves. So this is something we could, in fact, try out potentially here in the Shanghai Lectures would be a terrific opportunity. Well, I, think, I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so let's keep in touch and let's see how we could possibly figure it out. But uh, what I would like to do is now, even though we're way over time, not just a little bit, I think we should still have one or two questions. I, I think agree. it's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, for the students. So are there questions for uh, uh, Professor Weibel? Uh, I, I have a question if there is one. Vincent, that is. If, if there is space. Go ahead, Vincent. I was waiting for your question. <laughs> Uh, no, I have a whole lot, but yeah, I'll just I'll just ask you one. Um, I, I have spoken to some people in in this community, uh, particularly those who are working on speech, um, and there seems to be a tendency to think that they are running up against some kind of a performance wall, so to speak, so that you know the performance go, gets better every year, uh, but that it's sort of the in increase was 10% uh, in five years, and now it's you know 1% per year, and then later it will be half a percent, and so on. So, so is there? Uh, so, and some people think you know that might be wrong, but some people think that well, in order to make this get really, really close to very good performance, we might have to add some of those pesky details back in there, like uh, what kind of interaction are we looking at and what is the person trying to do and all these uh, cognitive bits there. Um, it, do you think that that, uh, do you think first of all that that's true, that this might be, that you might be running up against a wall of that sort? I mean, it might be a wall which is very, very close to 100% or to human performance, so it will still be great, right? Um, and, and secondly, if you think that that's true, would you envisage sort of supplementing the kind of work that you're doing with other, uh, let's say, cognitive approaches? Yeah, let me answer a couple of things. First of all, of course, it's uh, 
um, you know, one percent is not impressive if you have a accuracy of fifty percent. But if you're up at ninety-nine percent, one percent is awfully impressive, and if you can reach it, uh, so it's it's natural that things will asymptote after a while when performance improves. But uh, less flippantly to answer your question, um, it is certainly true that we that in, increasing performance and particularly um, delicate issues of nuances and so forth uh, become issues when 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 you do that. To me, it's actually not so much of a wall of performance because those people who just operate on gigantic amounts of data, uh, like Google-sized data, there's probably Google and uh, and the um, uh, secret services of the world probably sit on data tro troves that are so enormous that this all doesn't matter because, you know, if at some point you have for each sentence in the world, in theory, at, at least if you had a large number of data and you have almost every uh, uh, type of sentence translated, you can do awfully an awful lot simply by massive data classification. Right, so you think that wall doesn't actually exist? Yeah. It comes out in another area. I think the wall exists um, in its topical and domain adaptation, and the wall does exist when it comes to dealing with languages where you do not have that amount of data. So if we're talking about English, Chinese, and English, Spanish, we have a ton of data, right? But if you go into particular combinations of low resource languages, it becomes much harder. And this is where things are disturbing because we're training our systems on more data than a 21 year old has heard in his lifetime. So if, uh, you know, this can't be right. I mean, human beings clearly can do with less data and still make, build more powerful systems through that learning. So at that level, I think it's critical to put this more into perspective and connect that better. And again, already in the translation systems, we use uh, contextual knowledge. But the contextual knowledge is pretty dumb. We, we're looking at the last three words or maybe four words, and we have certain trigger statistics, etc. So really what's, what's exciting and interesting is to look at uh, semantically contextual knowledge, uh, pragmatic uh, uh, issues, and we're scratching the surface of that. It's a very simple thing that we're doing right now, for example, in the lectures, is that we look at a particular lecture and look at the PowerPoint slides of the speaker. In the power, I asked uh, uh, Rolf for all his PowerPoint slides, so we can mine all the PowerPoint slides for the the um, for the words that Rolf likes to use. And uh, the words in his slides will give a, tip us off to similar words that he doesn't use, but that could be relevant, right? So, you know, there may be robotics, and there, this may be related to something else, and maybe you need uh, the word kinematics, let's say, and, and even though it might not be in the foil, you can look in the internet and see that these words are semantically related and therefore also statistically related. So we can pull this information in, replace our vocabularies, look, look at similar texts in the other language and get correspondences. So there's an awful lot we can do. I don't know if you want to call that intelligent behavior, but it's certainly looking at context and uh, semantic relationships. And I think that trend will continue. The better the systems become at a very superficial level, and the more we want to drive it at, at very fine distinctions. I mentioned the case with a nail. If you knew whether you're in a beauty parlor or whether you're in a hardware store, should give you a big tip off whether you're talking about clavos or uh, uñas. And indeed, we're actually beginning to look at contextual knowledge that is comes from multimodal information or from location information. And all of that information should be brought to bear on the problem as well. Can't hear you, Rolf. Rolf, no sound. Okay, right, sorry. So I think we're, uh, you know, not 1%, but 50% over time, but I still think we should have one last question from the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. Just a quick, short question and a short answer. 
Uh, what scale uh, of elements in the... Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, what scale of elements uh, in the dictionary of your system? Uh, which uh, units are translated uh, uh, with one-to-one uh, -one correspondence? Uh, let me see if I understood your question. What skills did you say? Uh, what scale of elements in your dictionary? Morphemes, lexemes, words? Yes. Um, well, the dictionaries, uh, uh, there are two lines of thought. One is to use existing dictionaries that have done uh, to introduce them into a system. But typically what happens is we get these dictionaries or we build these dictionaries from parallel corpora. So. The typical approach is to just collect a lot of data that has been translated previously, and then from that data, do alignments between the sentences, and then find the word-to-word -word correspondences. So that gives you a translation table, and that translation table then gives you many translations for each word, but they're completely statistically arrived. So sometimes the system will in fact make errors because there were misalignments in the training data, or it mapped a word on something strange. And of course, it's not as simple as I just made it sound because sometimes one word translates into two in the other language. And sometimes these words are not side by side, but separated by some distance. And so the decoding uh, algorithms get more complex than this. But our translation tables essentially contain phrases, as we call, that are matches between input and output language derived by a parallel corpus. Now, is this very intelligent? Um, I think this is clearly open for improvements. I mean, we've gotten from words to phrases at least, which was a big improvement in these translation systems. But I think it might be very nice to get, uh, upgrade or enhance these translation tables, but additional information uh, contextual information, as I said, but maybe also semantics. So we have some semanticists and some uh, people who are interested in statistical learning and semantics in our teams um, who are looking at that problem. Okay. Well, I think that's probably a good uh, uh, statement to finish the discussion. So once again, Alex, thank you very, very much for a fascinating lecture, and thanks to the audience for your patience and also for the discussion. So, uh